Hello and welcome to this Learn English Professionals recording, brought to you by the British Council. Before change, there must be analysis. Organizational change is a costly and difficult business, and there must be a real business need reason in order to change current practice. Typically, changes are attempts to reach new markets, to improve productivity, or to cope with drastically reduced funding. A good analyst will identify the key problem. Once it's clear what change is required, a change strategy has to be developed. In other words, somebody needs to say what should be done. Sometimes the idea will come from a visionary within the company, perhaps an imaginative and persuasive member of the management team. Otherwise, the company might bring in a consultant to help them find the right solution. Either way, management should also consult with staff at this stage. There should be meetings to help raise awareness for the need for change, and to give employees a chance to suggest their own solutions. Next comes what's probably the most problematic stage: implementation. Above all else, making the plan change a reality requires communication. Staff will need to be informed of new procedures, and, when necessary, trained in new skills. The most important member of the change management team at this stage is the gatekeeper. It's their job to be available to staff, to help them deal with problems they may be having with the changes, and answer any questions, making the change as painless as possible. Finally, there's the consolidation stage. There needs to be a way to collect feedback from employees on how the change is being received. Because there will still be some resistance to the change, even at this stage, someone needs to act as a champion for the innovation. The champion gives encouragement and raises morale by congratulating everyone on a successful changeover and on what's been achieved. Line management. Welcome back to the second part of our program. How do you manage? I have with me Jenny Buxton, who works in Ipswich. Welcome, Jenny. Hi. You work for a well-known firm of retailers, but it's not the products I wanted to talk to you about today. It's the people involved. You've been responsible for a staff of fifteen for a year or so now. Tell me how you got there. Well, I did the standard round of applications from university, and this is my second employer. I enjoy the area of retailing, but as far as managing staff, that's more recent, and so it's quite a new area for me with a whole new set of challenges. You pride yourself on being good with people. You've got quite a sociable, outgoing personality. I imagine you'd be a good person to work under. Well, that's what I like to think. But managing people isn't all about sitting down with a cup of tea and talking over issues. Being in a position of responsibility means you can be the bringer of bad news as well as good. You have to develop a thick skin to be unpopular, not to be liked for a decision you make. And I guess that can be hard at first. Yes, but the thing you learn if you stick at it long enough is that people will still respect you even if they don't like what you had to say on a particular subject or the way you acted. Um. Are there other aspects of line managing that you find difficult? One of the hardest, most awkward things is the issue of disciplinary action.、Mm. The company should have a system in place for dealing with this kind of area, and you have to make sure the system is understood and agreed by everyone. But ultimately, if you've taken the employee through all the procedures and he or she still doesn't shape up, some hard decisions have got to be made. We seem to be focusing a lot on the negative side here. <laughs> What about some of the positive things? Oh, the chance to help people reflect on things, how they're developing with the company. I like seeing people develop, change, and perhaps go off on a completely new path. Something that may never have occurred to them if you hadn't pointed them in that direction. I imagine it can be quite satisfying. Yes, and then there's the sheer variety. You plan your work. You have to get yourself well organised, but ultimately, no two days are ever the same. 
There's always a new challenge, and I like that more than anything. OK, uh, Craig and Gavin, I realise that there have been some problems between you recently, and I'd like to try and sort them out right now. Gavin, can you tell me why you think this problem has arisen now? You're asking me? Hmm. I really have no idea. I mean, I came into this job a year ago with a special project to do. I had a very positive attitude. I was excited about it. And Craig's just blocked me all along. Well, that's not fair at all. That's just not true. <laughs> OK, OK, one second. Uh, can everyone speak one at a time, please? Gavin, go on. Well, that's about it, really. I I've never felt as if I've been welcomed here. I mean, when I walk into the office, the others don't even say hello to me. That's just not true. It's you who doesn't say hello. Craig, please. Gavin, can you tell me why you think this situation may have arisen? Well, as I said, I've really no idea. Perhaps it's just my style. I'm very positive, energetic and outgoing, while everyone else here seems to be half asleep. Um, listen, I don't think that personal, judgmental comments like that help. Can we just stick to facts rather than opinions? OK. Well, I could see right away that some changes needed making here, so I set about making those changes. And was that part of your job description? Job description? Job description? That's all I ever hear around here. That's the problem with this place. There's no initiative, no energy. Mm, OK, uh, Craig, would you like to tell us what you feel the problem is? Well, I think it's quite clear, isn't it? M? <laughs> That's it. No. OK, as I said, can we keep away from personal comments here and stick to talking about the workplace? Well, I am talking about the workplace. He doesn't respect the limits of what he's supposed to do. He came in here for a one-year project, but has then tried to change the way everyone else works as well. Gavin, can you uh, respond to that? Well, my project involved everyone else. It was impossible to do what I had to do without getting other people to rethink the way they work. OK, I think that personality issues are crucial here. Mm, right, absolutely. Yeah. Personality issues are the most difficult things to change. Perhaps we'll never be able to resolve them. You are different people with different personalities and different ways of working. And so? Well, that doesn't mean the problem can't be solved. We have to be flexible, accept change and be tolerant of difference. <laughs> easy to say. Mm. Well, yes, it is easy to say, but <laughs> difficult to do. I don't deny that. However... What we need to do is review your project and look at everyone's roles and responsibilities in the project and in this organisation as a whole. If everyone sticks to and respects other people's roles and responsibilities, then we can at least settle on a good, constructive working atmosphere. When I was at university, I did a business course that covered advertising, marketing, sales and public relations. I'm really glad I did this particular course as, although it was vast, it gave me an overview of business in general and the different careers in communications. While I was studying, I realised that I was most interested in public relations and so I joined a couple of associations so I could start networking before leaving university. Through one of the organisations I joined, I was able to meet lots of experienced professionals who gave me advice on getting into the industry. I was also offered an internship in my final year. This meant I could build up my portfolio even before I'd finished studying. I think that it's extremely important, especially today when there are so many people wanting to work in PR, to do an internship to A, get a foot in the door, and B, have more on your CV than simply your studies. You have to show willing and prove that you're an enthusiastic, ambitious person who wants to succeed. It was hard studying and working at the same time, but at least it prepared me for the deadlines and long hours you're expected to put in with a PR job. My internship also meant that I built up a list of contacts in the media and PR industry itself. 
Both areas were very important in helping me get my first job as an account coordinator with a corporate public relations agency. I had to write and proofread flyers, keep track of media databases and other admin type stuff. It wasn't the most exciting of jobs, but at least it gave me a better insight into PR and helped me decide what I wanted to do after. I didn't have much journalism experience either before working for this company, so I learnt that as I went along. After about nine months, when I felt ready to tackle something a bit meatier, I applied for a job, still within the same company, with more responsibility. I became an account executive and very quickly felt at home in my new job. That was about two years ago. I've much more contact with our clients and I play a large role in developing public relations strategies. I still do a lot of writing with press releases, but I'm also more involved in organising special events like press conferences. I love what I do because I get to meet loads of different interesting people every day. You have to be quite outgoing and able to communicate easily, which I guess is more of a talent than a skill. If I had to start again, I'd choose to do a journalism option at university, as employers like you to have a journalism background. Otherwise, getting an internship was the best thing I've ever done, and I'd do it again, no problem. Work skills Relationship building. So, as we have seen then, relationship building is not the same as team building. Mm. When we talk about relationship building, we're talking about a competency in which we cultivate relationships both inside and outside the workplace with individuals and groups. <laughs> I'm going to sum up by suggesting practical ideas of how you can all develop your relationship building competency. Tips that you can easily incorporate into your day-to-day -day lives in such a way that they will eventually become a habit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to talk about informal relationships, but as we discussed earlier, the ideas can be transferred to a more formal environment. First, I'll talk about initiating new relationships. And then I'll mention a few ways that you can practice developing existing relationships. Let's start off with the obvious. Common sense is always a good starting point. <laughs> the first thing we should all do is to practice simple courtesies. This might seem like common sense to some people, but in actual fact, you'd be surprised at how many people do neglect these things. Set yourself a goal to say good morning to three people you normally wouldn't. We should also try to get to know colleagues outside the office. Ask people what their interests are. If you share an interest in tennis, say, suggest a game. Plan an occasional social event with co-workers. It doesn't have to be anything complicated. A coffee together or a picnic lunch, for example. <laughs> Another thing you can do is to actually target somebody in your office, somebody you would like to know better. Make it your goal to talk to them. Small talk is fine. Listen to what they say and take notice of the information you learn about their interests. Make sure you keep yourself up to date on what's happening in the world, too. You won't be very good at small talk if you don't know about current affairs. <laughs> That's true, yeah. So, let's imagine that we've done these things and that we've started a few new relationships. What can we do to develop them further? How can we nurture the relationships so they don't just fizzle out or stay on a plane? Well, for a start, we should focus on a person's good qualities and not on their deficiencies. Nobody's perfect after all. <laughs> we should also practice effective listening. We are all good at speaking, but how many of us really listen? And people want to be listened to. They appreciate it and they respond. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> If we are in a conflictive situation with somebody, we should focus on the issue and not on the person. So we can hammer out a point of disagreement, but then shake hands and go for a coffee. 
Usually, it is an issue that is the problem and not a person. <laughs> Choose somebody who you consider to be an acquaintance and make a point of learning something new about his or her interests. Think of some questions that you can ask them for when you next meet. Finally, when you're talking to people with whom you have a relationship of some kind, get into the habit of asking open-ended questions. That way, they'll be able to give their points of view. Sometimes people just need to have the chance to say what they think, and very often it doesn't happen. Work burnout. I'd like to thank you both for coming along today. Pam, this is your new book, Taking the Blues Out of Work, How to Deal with Work-Related Health Problems. Yes. And Steve, you've just recovered from work burnout, one of the most serious and common work-related problems, yes? Yes, that's right. I'm in the book. <laughs> Pam used me as a case study. Hmm. Yes. Steve came along to my clinic for help. He had a serious case of burnout. He followed a course of therapy and... Um... And she helped me to get my health back again. Well, that's great. It's good to hear there's a happy ending. Uh, Pam, could you tell us what work burnout actually is? Aren't we just talking about stress here? Is there a difference? Yes, there is a difference. A very big difference. But that's a good question because most people make the mistake of thinking that burnout is just another word for stress. So I'll start with that. Everyone understands stress. We live in a world where stress is part of our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Burnout can be the result of too much stress, but it isn't the same thing. I once heard somebody say that if stress is like drowning in an overload of work, burnout is more like being all dried up. Ah. With stress, we lose our energy. With burnout, we lose much more, our motivation, our hope. And one very important difference between stress and burnout is that we know when we're stressed but we don't usually realise we are suffering from burnout... Until it's too late. Exactly. Mm. Uh, Steve, how did you know that your problem was more serious than just being stressed? Well, uh, I didn't realise myself. Other people realised first. I changed my behaviour and started feeling really negative and cynical about everything. That wasn't me at all. I've always been a happy-go-lucky sort of bloke. It got to the point where I felt so hopeless and depressed that I couldn't even face getting up in the morning. My wife made me an appointment with the doctor. He was helpful and referred me to Pam. But Steve was lucky to have the support of his family and friends. It's difficult to get better on your own. It's important to do normal things. Exercise, socialise, go for a walk... Meet a friend for a coffee. And did Steve need medication? No. We decided to try with everything else first. Medication can be effective. Antidepressants aren't the same these days as they used to be, but Steve got better without any. Hmm. In fact, it was something he felt quite strongly about. Mm. I don't even like taking an aspirin unless I really have to, so I think I made a real effort to listen to Pam and do the things she suggested. I even started meditating. Meditating? Yes. It can really help. It calms the mind and helps to shut out the world's distractions. And how are you now, Steve? I feel great. Better than I have for years. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, now let's talk a bit about the more general picture.